see the Parthian foot races last night? Darius ran like a gazelle. Jews don't go to foot races. Your old friend Simon himself used to run the wagering tables. We're not friends. Next. Okay, fine. So you did not go to the races? You stay home? I went to see my mother. Ugh. That would put me out, too. She asked when you're going to give her grandchildren? She didn't ask. I thought your parents don't speak to you. I had questions I couldn't ask anyone else. A mother of a son with talent like yours should be proud. She's ashamed that I could use the talent that God gave me against God. Next. You're good at something. You found a way to make a living doing it. It's that simple. Must be nice to live in a world so simply ordered. We live in the same world, Matthew. Next. Besides, what else are you gonna do with a mind like yours? Matthew. Matthew, son of Alpheus. Yes. Follow me. Me? <laughs> yes, you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what are you doing? You want me to join you? Keep moving, street preacher. Do you have any idea what this guy's done? Do you even know him? Yes. Listen, I said to... What are you doing? Where do you think you're going? Guys, let me go. Have you lost your mind? You have money. Quintus protects you. No Jew lives as good as you. You're gonna throw it all away. Yes. I don't get it. You didn't get it when I chose you either. But this is different. I'm not a tax collector. Get used to different. I'm glad we passed by your booth today, Matthew. Yes. Shall we? We have a celebration to prepare for. You will regret this, Matthew. What's the tablet for? I grabbed it without thinking. I can put it back. No, no, keep it. You may yet find use for it. Where are we going? A dinner party. I'm not welcome at dinner parties. Well, that's not going to be a problem tonight. You're the host.
Good morning. It's good to see you and to be here with you at Goodview Trinity, where we seek every week to worship, learn, and serve Jesus. And that's uh, our, our weekly tasks, really, are, are those three, um, including for me. So I find this to be a very worshipful, learnful, and serveful experience uh, for myself as well. I hope that you do also. We are going to follow along with the spotlight folder that you grabbed on the way in, but everything is also going to be up on the screen as well. Um, some quick housekeeping items before we get into things. Let's see what we got up here. Oh, blood drive coming up in, what's that, like a little over a week? Um, Tuesday, September 5th in the afternoon. Um, there is a sign-up sheet just outside this room right as you get into the lobby to the left. You'll see a table with American Red Cross. Um, you can sign up to uh, volunteer to, to bring baked goods or volunteer to serve food. Those are the two things to sign up for, especially the serving food. So if you have that in your heart, please do sign up to do that that day. But also you could sign up with the Red Cross to, to give blood, something that um, I've done the last, the last one time I think that I gave blood, I finally signed up to do it through the app. And when you sign up for giving blood through the app, then um, it tells you on the app afterward, in the weeks after you give blood, it tells you where your blood went and where it went to go help people. And so apparently people in, I think it was Pooler, Georgia, and like one other place, received my blood. And that's just really cool to know that, hey, I was able to make an impact, and I know actually geographically where that was. So just a cool thing. Keep in mind that opportunity to serve. Um, today, we are focusing on the really this phrase, comfort, comfort. So can you say that with me? Comfort, comfort. That is um, going to be in a song that we're going to sing later on, and that's going to weave its way through our readings and through the message that I'm going to preach, even though really what we're doing is we're exploring more about the heart of God, trying to get a better grasp on good um, uh, person-centered theology. That's kind of a technical way to think of it, but maybe that'll um, light up some things in your heart. And then uh, this is a diagram. It'll be clearer. I've, I've smudged it here for at this point just to kind of tease what it's going to be. It's going to be a diagram for you to fill in the blanks in your folder with, um, but that'll come up later when we get into our preaching. So please do be ready to take some notes. Um, and then uh, we're going to get started right away with our first song. So the song With His Wounds. This is a song that's actually uh, verses from Isaiah 53 in the ESV translation that are set to music, um, written, the music written by a group that we've done several songs um, of by now. Uh, the group is called The Corner Room. Hopefully this is a worshipful experience for you. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With his wounds we are healed, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned.
He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And with his wounds we are healed, and with his wounds we standing as we now move on right away into our next song, uh, singing in celebration of uh, what we just considered in uh, the first song. The song we're going to sing now is Holy Water. Sit boy. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these desert roads, water for my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears Like holy water on my skin Dead man walking, slave to sin I want to know about being born again I need you So take me to the riverside, take me under baptize, I need you, oh I need you. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips, like the sound of a symphony to my ears, like holy water on my skin. forgiveness is like sweet sweet honey on my lips like the sound of a symphony to my ears like holy water your forgiveness is like sweet sweet honey on my lips like the sound of a symphony to my ears like holy
a seat. All right. Is a reading from the Bible. Uh, we're going to have a few readings in a row here that are going to be a sequence leading into our next song. We'll start with a uh, historical reading from the Old Testament. This is uh, the book of 2 Kings. This is going to be set in the capital city for the kingdom of Judah, God's people there in the Old Testament. So this is roughly 600 years before Jesus showed up on the scene of world history. And um, it was foretold that the uh, Babylonian Empire, a vicious military force, would overtake Judah and the capital city of Jerusalem. And here we have it taking place during the kingship of uh, Judah's king, Zedekiah. 2 Kings 24, going into 25. Now Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. So in the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, on the tenth day of the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, marched against Jerusalem with his whole army. He encamped outside the city and built siege works all around it. The city was kept under siege until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine in the city had become so severe that there was no food for the people to eat. Then the city wall was broken through, and the whole army fled at night through the gate between the two walls near the king's garden. Though the Babylonians were surrounding the city, they fled toward the Arabah, but the Babylonian army pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho. All his soldiers were separated from him and scattered, and he was captured. On the seventh day of the fifth month, in the nineteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, commander of the imperial guard, an official of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He set fire to the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every important building he burned down. The whole Babylonian army, under the commander of the imperial guard, broke down the walls around Jerusalem. Nebuzaradan, the commander of the guard, carried into exile the people who remained in the city, along with the rest of the populace and those who had deserted to the king of Babylon. This is the word of the Lord. We now continue on with our next reading. Still in the Old Testament, this in the Old Testament song book, the book of Psalms. We're going to be in Psalm 137. This is going to give us a feel for what it was like to have been brought into exile through the events that we just read in 2 Kings. Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion, Zion being another name for Jerusalem. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. This is the word of the Lord. And then our third reading in this sequence, still in the Old Testament, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 40. This is going to be words of prophecy written more than 100 years before any of this happened. But it was speaking ahead to what the conclusion of the matter would be from God's wisdom and God's command of history. Isaiah 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all people will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Again, as you are able, please stand as we now sing a song from Isaiah 40. The song is called Comfort, Comfort. You may recognize it um, as a classic hymn. 
slightly new tune, but made to be intuitive. with the folder, which is good. All their sins are God will pardon, blotting out each dark misdeed. All that well deserve his anger, he no more will see or heed. They have sung many a day now their griefs have passed away God will change their aching sadness into ever springing gladness straighten out the Uh, get into the message that I'll be uh, preaching, continuing our theme of comfort, comfort, um, we are going to have a short, just a snippet of a Bible project video. So this is just about a minute long, um, a portion of uh, their intro to 1 Timothy. We're going to be looking at the Apostle Paul's letter to Timothy, the first one in the New Testament. So 1 Timothy, and so this is just the beginning of the Bible Project's intro video to that book, just to give you some context before we dive into the text itself in just a moment. Paul's first letter to Timothy. Paul spent many years traveling about and starting new churches, and he developed a large team of co-workers in this mission. Timothy was one of these. Paul was once in the city of Lystra, and he met Timothy's faithful mother and grandmother, and he was impressed by Timothy's passion and devotion to Jesus. And so Paul mentored him for many years and eventually started sending him on missions to different churches. And so when Paul got word about a group of leaders who infiltrated the influential church in Ephesus, they were spreading incorrect views about Jesus and what it means to follow him, he sent Timothy to confront these leaders and restore order to this church. So after Timothy arrived there, Paul sent this letter to follow up and instruct him on how to fulfill this mission. The letter has a really cool design. There's an opening and closing commission to Timothy to go confront these leaders and their bad theology. And then these surround two large central sections that are full of really practical instructions about the problems that Timothy faced in the Ephesian church. And then finally, all these sections are linked together or concluded by a series of three poems that each exalt the risen Jesus as the king of the world.
grace, mercy, and peace in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm just going to say the thing. I'm going to say the heavy thing that's kind of tough. Jesus isn't making as much sense today compared to years ago, or at least the way that ministry in his name is being done isn't as effective as it once was. I think it really used to be that if you could get someone to come to a church, almost any Christian church, they very possibly could end up returning to church again and again. But now, that seems less likely. So there's a responsibility on the part of churches to understand the changing world around us in a way we didn't have to before, at least if we want to make an impact in our community in the name of Jesus. Think of it like this. There is a famous tactic for doing door-to-door sharing of Jesus. It's where a pastor, or really any church person, asks their neighbor, maybe a complete stranger, a very charged question. That question is something like, if you were to die tonight and meet God, what would you say to God regarding you getting into heaven? That's a charged question. And questions like that were taught to me in seminary as a decent way to engage with people about Jesus. The thought being that it really might get a good conversation going. That question posed to someone today, though, don't you think it's less likely to lead to a good conversation or less likely to lead to them giving your church a try? What I'm getting at is crisis. These moments in people's hearts, moments of conflict and mess that need to be fixed. Crisis. And there was one such exact moment of crisis just a little over 500 years ago, and it's still playing out today. That one moment of crisis was Martin Luther's tower experience. Martin Luther was in a tower room, it was his study, in a building called the Black Cloister in Wittenberg, Germany. And a lot had led to this one moment. Luther had struggled for years to figure out what to do about his sins. He didn't sense that he was getting the right answers on that from the Roman church. And some of the messages in the Bible to help someone in Luther's position, he couldn't sort them out. Probably again because of the influence of the very politicized Roman church. And it all led to what's called his tower experience, in which he finally grappled with how God's message of stern law and the mutually exclusive message, also from God, of pure grace, it it, it clicked. And an entire theology, an entire reformation that still affects to this day, all these centuries later, it all happened right then. The way history played out made it so that what happened to Martin Luther was at just the right time with the right circumstances in the Roman church so that something kind of new could start right then and there, going on till now, a reformation, even impacting the Roman church that Luther and many others broke off from. The reason I bring up this history of Martin Luther's life is that we've taken Luther's crisis that crisis with the problem of his personal sinfulness, we've enshrined that crisis into our faith tradition. For so many years now, churches have focused a lot on personal sinfulness and the need to solve that problem as soon as possible. And again, and again, because of the fact of continued sin in our lives. And this all makes sense. But here's where I'm going to challenge you a bit. You might say I've already challenged you by bringing up so much history. 
Um, but I mean, I'm going to challenge you at a deeper level, not by saying that sin and grace are not important topics to go back to again, to rehash. I mean, there's still the crisis of the problem of sin, a crisis hopefully playing out in each of our hearts with some repetition. But here's the challenge. Having to reckon with our sinfulness, this awareness of our sin, having to reckon with our sinfulness isn't the only crisis our faith must face. It's not the only crisis. There's another crisis, another big one, that might just be more relevant in today's culture, maybe even more relevant for you personally. It's this. Doubting the simple statement we have from the Bible about God. Doubting that God is love. Doubting that God truly and simply is love. Let me show you from the Bible what I mean. We'll be in 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting with the second half of verse 7, going through verse 10. Here we go. Train yourself to be godly. Her physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. There's a couple things going on in here, so allow me to give you a handle on the flow of thought here. First, there's the encouragement for you to train yourself in godliness. And then, at the end of the passage, we focus on some good old-fashioned theology. We have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. Those are big and pretty direct statements about God, but they don't have to overshadow what came before. In fact, the Apostle Paul who wrote this was connecting these big theological statements with the godliness command. This godliness command is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. And this godliness command is why we labor and strive because, you know, in Christian ministry, because we have put our hope in God, who is proclaimed with these great statements. It's all wrapped up together. At the seminary I graduated from, I had a professor who explained this passage and a few others that follow a similar flow of thought uh, with a diagram that I've recreated. It's up here on the screen and it's in your folder too. It's spheres of comfort, the different layered circles of comfort that God blesses us with. And the inner circle is God is the savior of all people. And feel free to draw a cross in that inner circle too, because that's how God is the Savior of all people, by Jesus, the Son of God, dealing with our unlove and the injustice of our world that we've played a part in. Jesus dealt with our sin by taking it on himself at the cross. That means that he became the world's one great sinner in a way. God the Father declaring that Jesus, for your, that through Jesus your sins have already been meted out, but on Jesus. And it wasn't accomplished until every sin was laid on him. And that cross event, that historic salvation, as we're told here, it's a salvation for all people. Well, that's incredibly comforting because you are part of the world. You're not non-human. And every human's sins went on Jesus by his own willing sacrifice. What amazing comfort. Yet, Paul, the apostle, writing this, didn't only say that. He said that God is not only the Savior of all people, but God is the Savior especially of those who believe. Well, people who believe in Jesus are part of humanity, so this would seem redundant to our ears. God is the Savior of every single person and also the Savior of this group. 
what Paul is doing is showing us another sphere of comfort. That there is another source of comfort for you, the believer. It's not completely apart from the cross of Jesus, but it's also this second distinct truth. And the second circle is you and others believe, have found what finally fills the depths of your heart. You see, you can take comfort not only in the cross, but that God acted in another way in real human history. And that is God, through the message of the cross, did something in your heart. Put faith there. This is not only a fact, but also a source of even more comfort for you. You may not feel like it every day or in every moment, but you know that Jesus has filled your heart as nothing else could. A truly unique fulfiller, the one who satisfies like none other can. When you have doubts about God's love, you can look to the cross, consider the cross of Jesus, and envision your sins going on to Jesus. But when you have those same doubts, you can also find comfort in the filling of your heart. That faith in Jesus, that filling of your heart that took place thousands of years after the cross event. But there's still one more sphere of comfort, and it's this. Godliness. Your choices aligning a little more with God's choices. When you have doubts about God's love, you can also take heart in the work God has done to grow you in the Jesus way of life. You can take heart in that. You can find comfort in what your increased godliness must mean about God. That the one who stands outside of the world, outside of our time, is so close to you and is so active deep inside you that it affects your lifestyle. It's not just that you're maybe a little better of a person. It's that you're the focus of God's attention. And how can you know? Because a heavenly joy, a heavenly patience, a heavenly faithfulness, a heavenly self-control, has found a foothold in your very own life. Or, as Paul wrote, godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This comfort speaks to God's love from beyond our world. That's comfort. And these three spheres of comfort, which, by the way, you could simplify to the cross, faith, and godliness. They're layered on top of each other, and they play off each other too. You can't separate this growth in godliness from the cross, or you'd be back at the bad theology of some of Martin Luther's opponents, that you better do some good before we tell you how much God loves you. No. The cross is the center circle there for a reason. But you also can't separate faith or the growth in godliness from the cross. Why? Because God knows how much comforting you need, how much consoling, how much continued input from God's loving heart you need. And if you don't have all this playing out in the Christian ministry happening in your context, you're missing out on something huge. So, it's a decent diagram. I think it can be a helpful one. Really, it's a teaching tool for me as I just walked you through how God intends to comfort you. But let's circle back now to the challenge. There are going to be times where you're going to feel sinful. You get kind of slapped in the face by the reality of something you've done. It'll make you feel sinful, make you feel sinfully rotten. And that's a real crisis. And it will happen more than once in your life. And in moments like that, you can come to me or to another trusted Christian friend, and you know what we're hopefully going to do? 
with you being in that specific crisis, we'll tell you about the cross. We won't point you to your faith and especially to your growth and godliness. Those things are still realities, but they're not the source of comfort for someone in the crisis of reckoning with their sinfulness. But that's simply not the only crisis your faith will face. Even though some elements of our faith tradition and other faith traditions like ours, even though these faith traditions have elements of how this plays out for in church that might suggest that this is the only spiritual crisis you'll face. What I'm saying is, there's an option for us to emphasize one truth over and over and to the de-emphasizing of other truths. And it's possible for that to make it so we talk right past people that we want to do ministry toward. Allow me to make it even clearer. If you feel weighed down at a spiritual level, less by your sinfulness than by something else, if the truth of sin and forgiveness of sins doesn't feel like it's quite getting at what's eating you up spiritually, that's okay. Some pastors make it too simple. They act like all we need to do is show you your sin and show you the cross, and then everything else is just psychology that your therapist can help you with. But all that will do is make you think that God doesn't really get you. And that's a big fat lie. God does get you. He gets how complicated it all can be for you. That you can have several conflicting, competing, not meshing well together opinions in your own mind about God. That's why he gives you more than one sphere of comfort to find refuge in, because Christianity isn't only sin and forgiveness. It actually goes even deeper. It's about love. God's love for you, your love for God, God's love for someone else, someone else's love for God, someone else's love for you, and your love for someone else. Not romantic love, real love. The kind of love significant enough for God to call himself it. In response to this, you might say that, no, you're just, you just so very often feel sinful. Fine. The cross is here. It's still at play. But if you don't feel that that's the central story of your faith, at least not all the time, that it's something maybe even deeper, like why God saves you, namely love, that wouldn't mean that something's wrong with you. And maybe church should reflect this variety of concerns that we have. Or the other response you might have is to say, that it's a different crisis, not the sinfulness crisis or the is God really love crisis, but instead you're just worried about the future. You don't know what's coming and it's got you nervous. But isn't that really the crisis I was just talking about? If God is love, if you live under God and God is real and God really is love and God is love for you, doesn't that at least start the conversation that's going to help you with your worry? Might you need a Christian friend or pastor not to tell you you're a sinner who needs forgiveness, even though there will be times you need to hear that? But might the present moment be about showcasing love, the love of God to send his son to the cross for you, and the love of God to satisfy your heart with faith in Christ and the opportunities God has placed in your life to love and be loved, to grow in the godliness of finding someone who hasn't felt so loved lately and you loving them? Maybe we need to explore together more about what it means to love. Maybe we should emphasize that. Maybe I should 
Maybe you should. Maybe church should be molded around that instead of a narrower crisis felt specifically by an important church person 500 years ago. Maybe that's why the New Testament never once calls a church-going person a sinner. And maybe this foundational truth, that God truly and simply is love, is finally what will get your neighbor to church. Or, once here, combined with the cross, get them to keep coming back. Because the hunch they have that love is good, they'll see that it actually makes sense to explain everything else only in Jesus. We're saved from sin, yes, but we're saved for love. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you stake the claim of who you are on love. Help us to build our entire worldview, our entire theology, our entire life, lives, more and more on the comfort we find in being loved and being involved in the great ongoing wild project that is love. In your name, Jesus, in the name of you in whom love actually and finally makes sense, the name you call yourself, love, we pray. Amen. Please stand. As we sing together, In this song, we get to share together the expression of uh, how beautiful and powerful and unique God's love is. We declare it to one another in song. Could we withink the oceans fill and were the sky of parchment made were every reed on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry the scroll could not Contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. The kind of love that Jesus shows will never end and always be as strong as God and free to those whose hearts are willing, whose flesh is this love will be their constant light, their morning star, their guide, their courage in the darkest night forever by their side. And were the God of whom we sing a vaguely glorious Have you remain standing? A portion of our spotlight um, focusing on prayer.
I'm going to lead us in a prayer, um, and then we'll get after that into the Lord's Prayer. So for the AV person up in the booth, I will indicate when we're moving on to the Lord's Prayer, but we will not start with it. Thank you. We pray. Lord Jesus, our world needs you. We need you. Everyone needs you. We need you to shower us with your love. We need you to make it so that we can understand your love, at least enough that we can recognize it as the ultimate good, the ultimate and best thing, the love that you have had and that you want to continue to show to those you have created. Lord, we look on with sadness and grief on the violence that we see in our world, that we see in our own country, and the very many moments that we've seen in the media of people showing violence to one another and bringing their hate, um, manifesting that in hurt for people. We ask that you would please bring healing. Please bring change to people's hearts. Please bring love into every crevice of every community in all of our land. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for the work of those who have brought your love to bear on the world in small ways, as happens every day in ways that we don't know about, but we thank you for it happening in our own congregation, but everywhere in, in, in the world. And we thank you for the big things that people have done, like the work of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. 60 years ago who gave his I Have a Dream speech. And we ask that you would continue to bring more understanding, more reconciliation, and more love to our fractured nation. And we pray together the prayer, Jesus, that you taught us the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. And all God's people said, amen. I'll have you stay standing then as you are able for our final song. We sing together one that uh, has been lighting up our hearts a lot lately. Hopefully it's meaningful for you today. The song is He's Making Us. We're thinking about how uh, if, thing is, if, if uh, God is really all about love, if God is love, then God is still active, loving us. And as it turns out, he's still making us through all that God does in our lives. So we sing the song. When he's speaking the light, when he's forming the dust, when he's fashioning ribs into lovers, breathtaking, he's making us. When he's watching the fall, when his judgment is just But he still makes a promise That's great but heartbreaking He's making us He's making a way Where no way has been Inventing his guests Inviting them in to trust the trust he offers because love is the risk that is worth taking he's making us when he loves enemies when he disciplines some 
when he pours out his rain on the real and the faking he's making us when he's putting on flesh when he's bearing a cross when he's dying alone by his family forsaken he's making us he's making a way where no way has been inventing his guests inviting them in to trust in the trust he offers because Love is the risk that is worth taking, he's making us. When he's bringing us home, when he's saying well done, when he's reaping the fruit of this whole under together we sing of a love glorious as he wipes every tear and removes all our aching and he shows us the point of the pains he's been taking was to be more than one with the ones he's been making he's making us Again, don't forget about the uh, blood drive coming up Tuesday, September 5th. Opportunities to sign up to help. Come the table just as you leave the sanctuary on the left in the lobby. Um, and make sure to greet warmly those that you got to worship, learn, and serve with today. Um, and uh, uh, if you want to, you know, stick around and uh, just get to know one another. Um, I'd love to get to know you more too. So uh, feel free to spend some time in the lobby, just uh, drinking coffee and hanging out. Um, but uh, uh, go and bring the light of Jesus that you have uh, been able to participate in this morning. Bring it out into the world. Um, God is with you. Take care.